Welcome to you if you're online. We're glad that you're here with us as well. There are notes somewhere in cyberspace. You can maybe get them in the, uh, the side column there or go over to our website. There's notes there for you to download. And also we have notes in the back if you're new here today. And so we typically cover a lot of information. And I don't expect you to remember much of it, but these things do help. And my prayer is, our prayer is, that you remember something that the Lord will speak to us today. Every morning, every Sunday morning, we pray at 9 a.m., and we pray specifically for the service, that God would work among us, that he would open our hearts, it would help me to communicate, and all the folks who are teaching in various ways, and our, our uh, worship team, and all the rest. And so know that you are prayed for, and that we need God to do his work, because all I have is words, but he has power, right? And his word is powerful. And so I ask, and we ask, that God would be working among us. So... Hopefully we'll have that heart as we're here in saying, God, will you speak to me today? God, will you um, meet me today? And I trust that he has and he will continue to do so. One other announcement, uh, two weeks from now on July 23rd, we are doing a baptism. And so I have typically in the past done baptisms in the evening at smaller groups. And we did one on Easter Sunday and I'm like, I'm always going to do these on Sunday because it was really fun to see that and to hear the testimony. So I have a person come to me and says, hey, I have decided to get baptized. Can we do one? I'm like, absolutely. And I said, I'll open it up to the rest of the church to participate. So if you say, hey, I would like to be baptized. I'm interested in this. I want to know more. Some information for you. Love to sit down, talk with you about what that might mean for you. In two weeks, Sunday morning, We'll be doing a baptism here. Okay, this morning we are again back in the Gospel of John. So we're in John chapter 8. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up. And if you don't have a Bible with you or on your phone, there are Bibles right in front of you in the pew. And I looked it up this week, and so it's page 758 if you want to use the Bible in front of you. And I learned a trick from Tom. Were you saying that? Yeah, come on, Tom, right here. He preached like a number of weeks ago. I'm like, I should probably do that. So thanks, Tom. So it's in page 758 right in front of you of course on your phone i do typically have the scriptures on the screen so we can indeed focus in on those things okay so john chapter 8 what's happening here okay well this is what's going on there is a discussion that's really has turned into a dispute between those who are hearing him and Jesus at this point is in Jerusalem there is a massive festival that's happening People are all around, and Jesus now is teaching primarily about himself. And before this point, he'd been traveling around, typically in the north part of Israel, sometimes down in the south, and doing his miracles and teaching. And he was the talk of the nation. Everyone was talking about him, and everyone had an opinion about him. Some on one side of the, uh, the continuum believed indeed he was who he said he was. He was the Christ, the Messiah, and they looked to worship him. And then all the way on the other end of the continuum were a group of people who wanted to kill him and crucify him as a heretic. And in between those two strong opinions were so many other people as they were mulling through and trying trying to figure out, we're going to see as we turn into the next chapters, another miracle and these type of things. And Jesus was making some massive, incredible claims just within these last two chapters. Jesus claimed that he was the source of living water. He said that he was the light of the world. He claimed that he was from above and not of this world. He told them, the crowds listening to him, that they would die in their sins if they did not believe him. He stated that he always does what pleases his Father. And that as the Son of God, he can set us free. You are therefore free indeed. These are profound and incredible claims and statements. 
And if they are true, if he is true, they have far-reaching implications with transformative power, which requires reorientation of one's life around Jesus. I want us to capture and connect with his claims, what he was saying, what he was proclaiming, what he was doing. There was indeed no man as this man. The whole point of the writing you have to make a determination, determination as we listen to the words of Christ, as we open our minds and our hearts to indeed who this man says he is. Your understanding of who Christ is matters. Matters how you live and determines where you will be throughout eternity. It's a big deal because he is a big deal. And so this gospel was written, recorded for us by the, and through believe in him and have life in his name, which is the theme of this message series. So, Again, we're diving into John chapter 8, and we're picking up this uh, conversation in verse 37. And I'm going to read our whole passage this morning so that you can see the flow of thought before I break it up and we kind of look at a certain things. And I want you to pay attention to what Christ is claiming about himself and especially the marks or the characteristics between those who belong to God and those who do not. Again, they're debating with the religious people who truly belongs to God. And Jesus says, here are the people, the characteristics, the evidences of those who indeed belong to God. So I'm going to read it in its entirety. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. They said, well, Abraham's our father, the answer. Jesus replied, well, if you were Abraham's children then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. And so the people listening then responded to Jesus saying, we are not illegitimate children. Illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, Well, if God were your father, you would love me. For I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? <laughs> and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Right? Whoa, right? This is pointed. This is powerful. It is um, strong language to God. And in the passage we just read, I have found five evidences, and there may be more, but there is five for sure, five evidences of characteristics of those who belong to God which we are going to take a closer look at. And again, we have to ask, why is this important? Well, for one, <clears throat> excuse me, 
For one, your eternity depends on whether or not you are a child of God. Okay? You think, okay. So where we are on who Christ is matters for all eternity. The location and your experience of eternity depends whether or not you are a child of God. Now, Scripture tells us to examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test everything. And the test questions have been presented to us in this passage. So, Will you open your heart, go to the great physician this morning and say, take a look at me. Test to see what is happening in my mind, in my heart, in my spirit so that we can know that we are a child of God or we're not or we're thinking we are but we're not or perhaps, well, maybe I'm not but you are. Six of those who are in Christ are those who are children of God. So these questions are important. They're vitally important. They're eternally important to you as an individual, to those that you love, and to this entire world. So let's take a look at these characteristics of those who indeed belong to God. So we're going to go back up to the front and we're going to break it down one by one. So this again is John 8, 37 and 38. And we're going to see one of those characteristics here. So again, Jesus was said and said, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. Yet you're looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. Okay. I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence and you are doing what you have heard from your father. So the first thing in this passage is this. Those who belong to God have room for the word of God. Right? Those who belong to God have room for his word. In our hearts, in our minds, in our life, we intentionally make space for God's word within us. Now, it's interesting, the wording here, making space. The most important space in your entire life is not your kitchen, okay? It's the space in the, the house of your heart, so to speak. Right? The most important space is what goes on between your ears. What's in there? What's in here. We can put so much into our minds, so much into our hearts, so much that we're at capacity and it's hard to jam another thing in. Those who belong to God make space for the Word of God. Make room and make a priority and put a prominent place of saying that God's word in my mind, in my heart, living and investing and pouring through my spirit matters. So if there are people who say that, yes, I am indeed a child of God, or I am a, indeed a part of God's family, do they have space for God's word? And if it is absent from our heart and mind, then we are absent from God's family. Do you understand that? Where are you with God's word? Well, like Dave, we're in church, right? You are in church. Glad you he are here. And this gathering should be evidence of God's inworking of you, saying, I want to be in church because I love God and I love his family and I want to be under the word and I want to be in the word and I want to connect together. So where is the word in the information of your mind and heart? Right? You all have smartphones? You ever read anything on there? One person does not, right? <laughs> Which has its blessings, believe me. Right? We are bombarded all the time. Right? Where does the word of God fit in the hierarchy, hierarchy of your 
diet, intellectual, spiritual, emotional. Jesus said to these people, and then said to us, right, as they were debating, and they said, well, we're children of God. He says, okay, if you're a child of God, you need to have space for the word of God in your life. So do not fool yourself. If the Bible is a book among books versus the Bible being the book of all books, there's a difference, right? His word is active and powerful, alive, transformative. There is no word like it. Does it have space in you? Applies it to our life. Those who belong to God have room for the word of God. This is important and the first test of our uh, uh, authenticity as one who belongs to God. Don't fool yourself, nor be fooled by people who say they are followers of God or of Christ, but the word is somewhere on the periphery of their life. God, help us to love him and have his word in his heart, in our hearts. So this is the first thing that Christ pointed to, right? And so he says, hey, 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 right? Father, and I'm way down my list. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, that actually wasn't too bad. Okay. So they're re- replying to him saying, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. They said, Abraham is our father. They answered. Right? And then Christ said this, okay, all right. So if you say, Abraham's your father, say, if you were Abraham's children, then you would do what Abraham did. (laughs) As it is, you're looking a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham, do what Abraham did. So we have to ask a couple questions of this. Number one, who was Abraham? And then second, what did he do? And so if you're unfamiliar with the Old Testament, Abraham was a man whom God made a covenant with, and he made promises to. We see this in Genesis 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Right there brings these things forward. God promised to make him the father of many nations and to bless him abundantly. God promised that kings would come from him, even though his wife was barren. And God made an everlasting covenant to be God to him, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So Abraham not only had room in his heart for God's word, but he also believed it. Then his belief was evidenced by how he lived his life. His faith, as James says, was completed by his works. Now, it's different for taking the Bible and taking God's word and taking Jesus, the incarnate word, and knowing things about him and knowing information from it. There are plenty secular universities, non-Christian, who have Bible classes, including in this town, uh, to study it as literature versus um, recognizing it's the very word of God. There is a difference between understanding God's word, having in your head, and living God's word or believing God's word. Miles of difference. It's some of the worst atrocities that have happened in our planet were committed by some people who knew a lot about the word but didn't believe the word. Abraham heard God's word to him. And know what Abraham did? He believed. He believed. Do you believe what you are reading? Do you believe what is presented to you by the Holy Spirit? Or is it an intellectual exercise? Or is it something that you pay attention to and put your faith in what is written is true to you? This is important. Now, those who are listening there, these are physical descendants 
of Abraham. They were physical descendants of Isaac, the child of the promise. These Jewish people, because they had the DNA of Abraham, because they were his literal descendants, they thought that this made them children of God. But Jesus, in this passage, said, you belong to God only. Maybe some of you have had your DNA tested, right? And you know now your country of origin and what have you. But imagine if you sent in your spiritual DNA for testing, right? And you get this official email and response that says, you can trace your ancestry all the way back to Abraham. 4,000 years ago, you're a full-blooded son or daughter of Abraham. It is written all over your faith. Physical DNA is not the same as spiritual DNA. Do you hear me? Okay. They were confused. They were saying, well, 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 we are Jewish, right? We have our ancestry. Abraham is their father. So therefore, God's promise to Abraham now comes to us because of our physical DNA, Jesus here in this passage, and we'll see Paul in other passages say, hey, 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 don't be confused. It's not those who are physically of Abraham. Well, you are adopted into God's family when you believe as Abraham believed. That matters. And Paul unpacks this a little for us in Romans chapter 9. I'm going to read a couple of these verses saying, not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. Excuse me. <clears throat> but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Which means, and it's, there's, there's a lot we could go in here, but we're not going to have time. But we have to be of the faith of Abraham because the child of promise was Isaac, which was given by a promise. And because Abraham believed, okay, he was credited to him as righteousness and he was included as a child of God. We, in turn, it's not matter who your parents are. And what matters is who your God is, who your father is, and if you believe. And once you believe, you can become a child of God, regardless of your parentage, regardless of your skin color, regardless of your past. If you believe, you are adopted in May noon, give the Spirit of God everyone and anyone, anywhere. That's good news. That's good news. Good news for us who believe. And bad news for those who think, well, you know, I'm a child of God by default. You're not. Jesus is arguing with them. And they, there, the Jews who were there first listening to them, they, they had a hard time with it. They were like, what are you talking about? Right? And they responded, hey, listen, we're not illegitimate children. Like, Abraham is our father. What are you, what are you talking about? The only father we have is God himself. And then verse 42, Jesus said to them, well, if indeed if God was your father, you would love me. For I've come here from God. I've not come on my own. God sent me. This is the third characteristic of those who belong to God. Those who belong to God love Jesus. This is important. It's not just knowing Scripture and loving Scripture. It's loving the author and the focus of Scripture. The Word incarnate, which is Christ. Our mind needs to be transformed, but our heart has to be transformed. Right? If you know things about Christ and know spiritual truths about God, and I've talked to PhD students who know the Bible better than I, but they don't love Jesus, that's a problem. Right? Jesus is the focal point of the Old Testament. He is the cornerstone of the New Testament. He is our faithful brother, our Savior, our Lord, the Word incarnate. 
And if you love God, you will love the Son. Do you love Jesus? (laughs) And here is Jesus proclaiming to this crowd of people who claimed to love God, yet they wanted to kill him, right? Saying, listen, if you truly love God, then you will truly love me. That is an important characteristic of being a Christian. This is hearing his word. This is believing who he is. This is loving him. Do you love Jesus? Do you love him more than anyone or anything else? Remember when Jesus was was teaching and he said, hey, hey, if you love anyone more than me, what did he say? You're not worthy of me. It's not adding Jesus to one of the loves of our life. It is making Jesus the greatest love of our life. More than spouse. More than children. More than father. More than mother. It's not, well, I love my wife, I love Jesus, and I love cheesecake, right? (laughs) Depending on the day, the order switches. Is our love for Jesus greater than these things? Any one. This is what Jesus taught. This is what he is pointing towards here. And again, I mentioned it last week, but I'm going to mention it again this week. There are plenty in our planet who say they believe in God, but they reject Jesus. That's not possible according to Jesus. John the Apostle wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verse 23, No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. So you can't claim you follow the one true God if you reject the Son. No one can have the Father if they do not have the Son. Okay. This is significant to our society. Jesus, indeed, is the cornerstone of the family of God, but he's also the stumbling block and the rock of offense to those who disobey and disbelieve the word and the witness of Jesus. Jesus matters. Who he is matters. What he did matters. What he claims matters. It matters. And so those who indeed say that they love God, but they don't embrace Jesus, or they say they have God, but don't have Christ, they don't have the Father. This is important. And Jesus was proclaiming to those who loved him and those who wanted to kill him, if you are indeed one who belongs to God, you would indeed love me, the Son of God. Where is your love of Jesus today? Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. One of my loves. But go Cubs, right? Now, can you be excited about the Cubs? Sure, right? They eventually win sometimes. But if you had to choose between the Cubs and Jesus, choose Jesus. If you had to choose between your mom and Jesus, choose Jesus. And I hope you do love your mom. (laughs) That's not bad. It's actually good. Actually, we're commanded to love our parents but not more than Jesus. So Jesus was saying these things. And so those who belong to God love Jesus. 
Now, there's a couple other things that he talked about here as he's having this discussion. It's turning into a confrontation. <laughs> and he said in verse 43, hey, why is my language not clear to you? Right? You know why? Because you're unable to hear what I say. What type of hardness of heart is in play here? Right? That you're unable to hear. And then, here he comes, verse 44, you belong to your father, the devil. You want to carry out your father's desires. He goes on to describe uh, who the devil is, what he does. He's a murderer from the beginning. This is an interesting line here. Not holding to the truth. For there is no truth. In him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Point being this those who belong to God hold to the truth. Now, going back to this passage, <laughs> what I understand from this is the devil once knew the truth, but did not hold onto it. Again, remember from last week, if you were here with us, the importance of perseverance, the importance of holding on to the truth. Jesus told a parable about this, if you remember it, right? The four soils, do you remember this parable, right? The word of God was being sown, and in one place, and these places represent the soil of our soul, or our hearts, hardness, and the enemy came and took away the word. Now, in another place, the word of God fell on the soil of our soul, and it was received with gladness. But when it got difficult, the soil was shallow, and the seeds uh, burned away and became of nothing. And then the next one, the, it was received with gladness, and the word of God went deep. And then the weeds of the world and our worries, the carries of life, came in and choked out the life of the word in our heart, and then the fourth soil is that that produced a fruit up to a hundredfold, take in, nourish, loved, cherished, and grew beyond and above. So the question is not, are you, are you here hearing the word? The question is, what place does it have in your heart? And do you, will you, hold on to it? Again, it doesn't matter how you start, but how you finish. Right? When you're on your deathbed, I want you to be singing, Great is thy faithfulness. <laughs> oh, Jesus, I love thee. Right? Some of you have been here 96 years, or some of us, 56 years. Happy birthday, Lenny. <laughs> Your fan club is here as well, my friend. <clears throat> but where are you at all the way along, especially how do you finish? Don't waste the middle of your life, right? Don't say, well, I'm going to follow Jesus when I'm 96. You're going to lose out on a lot of joy and peace and power and reward, by the way, both here and to go. Not everyone knows the day they're going to die, by the way. Those who belong to God hold on to the truth. Jesus pointed out that the devil didn't hold to the truth, Right? Ooh. We hold to the truth by holding on to Jesus and the scriptures, right? And we need to be aware of the wiles of the devils, the lies of the devil, right? He is working to twist the identity of Jesus, who we think he is, to twist what is true about us in this world, to twist what is true that Scripture reveals about eternity. This is what he does. The devil came to do what? Kill, steal, and what? Destroy. Well, you see that in John chapter 10. Jesus came to give what? Life. And life how? 
stingingly. No, abundantly, right? There is a contrast between the one who comes to destroy and lie. And he is lying all the time. The best way that the devil works is covertly. If you realize that he's working, you can call him out. So he tries to work undercover. He tries to work in darkness. He tries to take what is good and twist it. Right? That's why he's a deceiver. He takes the good and twists it. Because he is a murderer. A liar. And so this passage is really strong. Right? Say, hey, listen to me, right? Your father, if you don't believe me, you have two choices. Your father is either God and you are, belong to him, or it's the devil and you belong to him. If you belong to God, you will desire to do his will. And if you belong to the devil, you desire to do his will. You have no other options. Make your choice, right? Whoa, that seems like black and white. <gasps> it is. <laughs> well, well. Take it up with Jesus, right? (laughs) Those who belong to God not only make space for the Word of God, not only believe God and put it into practice, they hold on to the truth. This is important. And Jesus then goes on telling those folks and telling us, <laughs> and those weren't believing them, he says, yet because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? He was saying to them, can you look at my life, this was Jesus talking, and, and see any sin here? And they tried to accuse him of breaking the Sabbath, and Jesus said, that's not how that works. They couldn't. He says, I'm telling you the truth. Why don't you believe me? Whatever belongs to God, here's what God says. Whoever belongs to God, here's what God says. Whoever belongs to God, here's what God says. The reason you don't hear, that you do not belong to God. This is our last point from this passage. Those who belong to God, hear what he says says, not just what he has said, past tense, but what he is saying, present tense. And I'm not saying we're writing new scripture. We're not, okay? What I'm saying is that when you approach the word, when you come hopefully in a Sunday morning, when you are hopefully reading the word to yourself, you say a simple prayer as I do. I say, God, will you speak to me today? That's what I pray. You can pray that. It's not hard, right? It's not just limited to pastors, right? Pray this. When we approach the word, and hopefully you are reading it on your own, pray this simple prayer. God, speak to me today. And then start to read. And the Holy Spirit, by His power, will highlight some things in our hearts, right? And He'll speak to us from His Word. He will confirm it, and He will guide it, and He will work in us, transforming us into the image of His Son. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing in us, right? And so I want to ask you, It'd be great to say, hey, what is Jesus speaking to you this week? That's a great way to to greet one another. It's a little scary, right? Um, uh, I don't know, right? And some of us are like, I'm I'm not sure. I want you to pay attention. (laughs) What has he spoken and what is he speaking? Highlighting perhaps some fear, right? I've been working through some of these things, and I look at Scripture, and I'm like, oh, all of these passages keep pouring on to me. I think, thank you, God, for helping me to see this. God, thank you, God, for strengthening me. God, thank you for your grace to me. Those are God's children. Hear his voice. And I'm not talking 
in a mystical sense, even though the Holy Spirit does prompt and speak and guide, he does, always according to his word, by the way, right? (laughs) I've had plenty of people tell me, well, God told me to, you know, like, oh, I'm having an affair with my wife. God told you that? I don't know what God you're listening to, but you're not listening to the God of the Bible. He did not tell you that. God will confirm his word. God will speak to us. Hearing him, listening to him, guided by him. Our, our, Our ears are attentive to him. Just like a child to the voice of their parents. Children know the voice of their parents. We can do an experiment. We can have bring up a set of kids and have you all talk at once and then once they hear their voice and this is they do this with infants by the way (laughs) they know the voice why because that child knows the voice of their mother or their father jesus is saying the same thing children those who belong to god hear what he says All right, so we're going to review. I'm going to come in for a landing here. (laughs) I think, right? I want you to think about this. Now, some of you, as you are standing in front of the great physician, God, today, and he asks you the diagnostic questions like any good doctor would, how you're feeling, how are you sleeping, what are you eating, what's happening? God asks us these questions as well. Test questions. And so some of us are doing well, right? And the questions are, have you room for the Word of God? Those who belong to God have room for the Word of God. Is there room for the Word of God in your life? What space is it? Is is it some closet? Only to come out at Christmas and Easter and maybe on Sunday? Or is it in your heart? Are we doing what Abraham did? Believing and then evidencing that our belief is how God and how we are working it out in our life. Do you love Jesus? These are simple tests, great questions. A lot of people can say they love God, but do you love Jesus? Are you holding to the truth? Are you hearing what he says? Again, going back to a passage I brought in the beginning, 2 Corinthians, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. And now for my second conclusion. Do you like this? Another verse just came to mind. Yeah. You remember um, uh, the book of Revelation? You guys read that with all the, you know, dragons and all that type of stuff? <laughs> Fascinating, amazing. Okay. A little bit complicated. But right in the beginning is this John, the one who wrote... The Gospel of John was alone on this island. The Lord Jesus came to him, right? And first we see this glorious image of who Jesus is. And if you haven't read it for a while, read just Revelation chapter 1. Christ in his glory and his strength and his power. It is magnificent, right? And then he speaks to John saying, hey, hey, write this down. Have some specific things for some specific churches. Seven of them to be exact. And to one of the churches, he says, hey, I love what you're doing, <laughs> but you lost that loving feeling, right? Thank you. Was the Righteous Brothers who sang that song? <laughs> no, that's going to be in your head. I know it. It's gonna... But that <laughs> matters, right? And so wh- where, is, where is your love for, for Jesus these days? If you think through your life, and this isn't, I'm not trying to do a guilt trip here. I'm just trying to bring things to memory, right? Where is your love for Christ these days? Right? Has it kind of dimmed? Is it flaming, flaming bright? Is it kind of somewhere in between? I'm asking you that question. And it's interesting what Christ told to the church. He says, remember from the height you've fallen, right? So remember what it once was like. What were you like when you first were saved? What was that like for you? 
remember. Then he says, repent from the height which you have fallen. Right? Return and do what you did at first. It brings those feelings again. Right? It's an interesting formula. It works, by the way, for marriage as well, but I'm talking for our hearts with Christ. Remember what your fire was. Where was it? What was happening? And if there's a difference between where it was and where it is, <laughs> repent. God, I'm sorry that I've lost that loving feeling. And it's gone, gone, gone. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Right? <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Please don't ever sing again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> It's funny, but it's actually really serious. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's sad, right? So just, you know, hey, that's one of the things. Like, where is that? Right? And so we're just doing a heart check today. Jesus is speaking to us today, right? And so I'm going to pray for us. And uh, I'm going to ask God to speak to us, right? As he has been, I hope. Just remind something and just, hey, examine yourself. And you say, hey, you know what? I need some prayer. I'm happy to pray with you. Folks who are going to be over that, by that sign will be happy to pray with you. People in this congregation will be happy, grateful to pray with you. And if you are going strong, hey, fan the flame, right, and keep going. So let's pray together. So, Father, here we are gathered um, here in this place. I know you're with us because you said you are. God. I see you working in us and through us, in spite of us sometimes. God, you're working. And Father, um, we heard these words today. God, I ask that every person in this building and can hear these words wherever they are would open their hearts and their minds as a patient to a doctor and say this is where I'm at God we're grateful that your word has reached us and God I ask that each one of us will Deal seriously with who Jesus is and what he claimed and what he commands. God, I ask that our love for Jesus the Son would just grow to overflowing. That God, your word would go perhaps from the per periphery of our life and mind to the core part of our thinking and being that we would orientate ourselves around you. God, I ask for the grace and the power to believe and to live as, Je as, as Abraham lived, God, following after Jesus, looking for the final fulfillment of that promise given to him. And so God, do that work among us. And Father, if some of us have drifted from you for whatever reason, or barely holding on to faith, we ask that you would draw us close to you, that you would hold us and pull us in. But you're doing that today. God, I don't know what's in everybody's heart. I, I don't. You do, Holy Spirit. And in this place, God, speak to us. Woo us, draw us, encourage us, convict us, strengthen us. God, we need more grace. So God, I ask that you would give grace to every person here, strength to every person here, truth and clarity to every person here for ourselves, for those we love. Fan into flame, God, your spirit in this place, in our heart, God, fan love for you from this community and from the nations back to you. Do that, we ask. We love you and we praise you. We thank you for your word in Jesus' name.